Welcome to OpenCV Tutorial. My name is Richard Kirshner from the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. And we're going to be going over the OpenCV Tutorial. And it's going to throw in some caross, and we're actually going to be covering a lot of ground um, in this tutorial. So I'll speed up for some of it and slow down as we focus on important aspects. When we talk about OpenCV, um, we're really talking about computer vision. Uh, so what is computer vision? And I would say OpenCV goes way beyond uh, computer vision. It goes into graphic editors and all kinds of other things. Uh, but we're going to be focusing a little bit on computer vision and we're going to cover the whole slew of the editors and all the other cool stuff that's in there. Computer vision is a field of machine learning whose goal is to help computers see. Its end goal is to make intelligent systems which can understand digital images. Uh, and you can, there's all kinds of different examples from handwriting, identification, categorizing of pictures, is that a dog or a cat in the picture, and all that different things. Those are all part of the computer vision. Um, uh, cars, the, the new automated cars, and being able to drive down the road, they usually use aspects of computer vision to do that for our AIs. So, what is OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV is a huge open source library for computer vision, machine learning, and image processing. It can be used to process images and videos to identify objects, faces, or even handwriting of a human. And one of the cool things is it's um, the OpenCV project is outside of Python, but it has a high integration with Python. So you can use it in other programming languages. You're not set to just Python with it. And it has a huge community behind it, which is really nice. That's what makes the Open uh, CV project so great. Uh, we'll start with installing the Open CV. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. In Python, you do a pip install OpenCV-Python. Uh, you can pip install OpenCV contrip Python headless. Um, OpenCV can be installed in Windows, Mac OS, or any GNU Linux distribution by using the pip command. Uh, the first one, the first command we went over is to install the main module packages and the second one is for the full package. And usually you want the full package. Um, once you start digging into it, it's so easy to use and there's so much fun things you can play with. So the most common thing is reading in uh, image in OpenCV. And we'll do this also in code. So if I go a little quick on the slides, it's so that we can roll up our sleeves and actually open up and do the coding on there. Uh, so when we're reading, reading an image in an OpenCV, given an image to load it in, we can use the OpenCV function imread. The image can be displayed using the function imshow. And so these are your two main categories on here. Uh, and so your basic thing is to read an image in, then you can manipulate it, and then you can display it depending on what you're using it for. And then when we talk about manipulating it, the most common thing is probably resizing images and videos. So you can read in videos, and we'll look at the command for that also and how you can process them frame by frame. Resizing is uh, helpful in all kinds of aspects. Obviously on the display, you might want to resize it so it fits the display a certain way. A lot of times that's handled um, for the size of the image. If you're uploading it to the web, you might want to have a smaller image so you're not taking up a huge amount of memory. Uh, not as big of a deal anymore, and then a lot of times the uh, actual web page would handle the size of the image once you upload it. Uh, but what if you want to process all the images under the same um, neural network? Well, they're going to look for the same size, and that's also is huge just to be able to resize your images to go into that neural network, so you're not looking at different sized images. And images read in might not be of correct size or might not fit the screen correctly. To overcome this, we can resize the image, and you can see it's a real simple command in the um, CV. And we're actually using what they call CV2. A lot of times people will just um, they'll import CV2 as, or open CV2 as CV just to make it easy. Because uh, they might have old code or something like that, and it's easy to swap things in and, and move forward. And you can see here we just resize, uh, we have our image, we have our new dimensions, and then how do we resize it? The interpolation is um, kind of a function in there as far as how to guess the colors because you're combining colors and different things. And we can use a drawing with the OpenCV. Uh, we can draw images in OpenCV. It allows us to draw various uh, things like a rectangle, circles, lines. Um, you can add text into the images and that kind of thing. 
So there's a whole slew of different things we can do with the open CV. And we'll look at these commands. We'll glance through them and show you how they work in the actual software. Uh, and they have basic image functions. And uh, this is just so cool because so much of this is built in. Uh, you go back 10 years and people are writing the code to do this stuff and now it's all built in and people are continually optimizing it. So you can do a lot of things without having to lift the hood up and really do the heavy lifting underneath. Uh, and so OpenCV has built-in functions which allow us to perform various operations on our images, such as uh, blurring, resizing, cascading, edge detection, and cropping. And there's also motion detection and videos. There's all kinds of things. Um, and you can see here we have uh, blurring where you can take an image and blur it slightly. We can resize it. Uh, it's easy to crop it. You know, that way you can do the little round head face cropping on a web page or whatever or identify where the object is and crop the background out kind of thing. And you have image transformation. Uh, we talked a little bit just a second ago on blurring. Uh, we can also do things like rotating it. Um, we can transform the image various ways. Uh, you can see here we can shift it. So we can shift it left, shift it right, flip it, crop it. Um, all of these are very easy to do in the OpenCV package. And then I mentioned a little bit about, we start looking at motion detection and detecting different things. Uh, there's contour detection, which is built into the OpenCV package, which is really nice. And again, this is stuff that it usually was somebody in the back end programming this, and now you have OpenCV, which does almost everything for you. Uh, so a contour is a curve or a line joining all points which have the same color or intensity. Contours help us find the points which lie in the same plane and assist in edge detection. And you can see here we've taken the cat and uh, done a contour detection and it kind of looks, it makes it look almost like someone uh, stenciled it in there. So that's kind of cool, a little Zen art going on there. Um, this is how the computer might, using contour detection, see the cat on the black background. Uh, and then you also can adjust the color channels. Uh, so you can play with all the colors. Any image is basically a combination of three main colors, red, green, blue, the RGB. Uh, sometimes <laughs> a quick note, which um, we won't cover in the programming, is when you see that RGB, it's not always in that order. Uh, there's different formats for it, and, so, and there's also sometimes the alpha channel. So you might have RGBA, where A is how uh, transparent it is. So you might actually have four channels, which... I like to work with when trying to take the background out because the edges of images actually have reflections um, and light is also a curve and wraps around. So there's some cool things to know when you're messing with these things. Um, and the OpenCV allows us to split our image into its uh, respective color channels. And you can see here we've taken the image of a um, little landscape and we've sorted it out into different channels and you can see how you have it all in the blues, the reds, and the greens. And there's also color spaces. Uh, color spaces are a way to represent the color channels present in an image. They tell us the various color channels which are contributing to a particular hue. So again, we can pull things out based on the hue and the images and colors on there. And blurring. Uh, blurring is very popular right now because it's easy to find someone's face and then blur out the background without having to play with alpha channels and different things for the coloring around the, you know, you have the edging of the head and the coloring. Uh, so blurring is a method used to remove noise from an image by applying a low pass filter over an image. We smooth out the edges and make the transition from one color to another very smooth. And you might not be able to see the difference in the cat video, but you start seeing uh, smoothness and sharpness have always been uh, a mainstay of editing images and things like that over the years. And so this is all built into OpenCV. And then there's bitwise operations. Bitwise operations are um, the and, or, zor, etc. in image processing. They are used to create a new image or for masking. Uh, and we'll glance at masking, but masking is huge. Um, and so when we get into the code, we'll talk a little bit more about masking. I'll, I'll probably maybe offshoot for a minute on that. The operation is done between each pixel of two images. And so you can see here we have the square um, plus the circle. So if it's an and, only where the white is. So where it's in both images, it then equals a new image with just the white parts. In masking, 
Uh, masking is used to bring certain parts of an image into focus by lowering the definition over other parts. This is done by reducing the pixel quality of other parts of the image. Kind of a little short on the, on the masking of what it is. Uh, so in this case, the masking would either be the background, might be all ones, and the cat and the fence might be zeros, or vice versa. We might put the cat as one and the background as zeros. And then you can do a transformation on either the background or the foreground to maybe you want to blur the background out and make the foreground sharper. Or maybe you want to make the, the little circle with the cat in it uh, <laughs> take the colors out so he's one color. Masking allows you to separate your image out and do those different things. And that's where the masking comes in. And it, it, it has a lot of uses. And then there's histograms. Uh, histograms, in an image processing, histograms typically refer to a graph of pixel intensity values. The intensity of each pixel is plotted in a histogram. Again, where we start, these histograms are the beginning of doing different identifications and can be used for different things. Um, you don't really publish a histogram onto your web page of the cats because it's just kind of silly, but you can use that data in uh, data processing to look at different things and pull different things out of the picture. Uh, thresholding, another important aspect of uh, image processing. A method of image segmentation, it is used to convert an image of binary by setting a, a threshold intensity value and deeming all values above it as one converted to white and below as zero black. And you can see here we were talking about masks. Um, in the threshold, we're able to actually create a mask of the image. In this case, you have the cats, which are mostly white, stand out because we put whatever the value is uh, to pull those cats out and put the background further back. Edge detection, uh, just like threshold, it's another tool we can use to bring out an image. Uh, so we can find different things on there. A lot of cool things we can do with that. Uh, you can see here we've taken a landscape, uh, same one we had before, and we can find the boundaries of an image uh, by consistency and brightness. It's used for image segmentation and data extraction. And you can see with this image of the buildings how uh, powerful it is just to pull the whole uh, sky out. I mean, you know where the sky is. There's no debate on it. Uh, so finding edge detection has a lot of cool things it can do when you're processing images and pulling the images apart. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. So uh, with that, uh, really the hands-on, there is so much hands-on on this. So we're going to start with a real uh, basic open CV setup in Python. We'll then take a look at some motion detection. Um, I usually don't put the video on here because my office is under construction. You can see the uh, partially finished wall in the back. Um, but it, when we do the motion detection, we'll have the video up and show you how to pull this video in just like I'm doing here and utilize that in a program. You can actually start detecting motions. You could think of a wilderness webcam or something like that, all kinds of fun things you can do with motion detection. Uh, and then we'll get into um, uh, melding a little bit with the OpenCV and write a, a, a short Keras um, neural network that will train and do facial um, identification. So we're gonna cover just a slew of really cool tools that you can do with OpenCV. So here's uh, my favorite package to work in, the Anaconda. Um, I'm going to be in Python 3.8. And then if you haven't yet, you need to go under Environments. Um, you can either install them through Anaconda here, or you can open up, um, let's see, where is it, 3.8. You can open up your terminal and do the pip install, like we discussed earlier in the slide. And that was this slide right here pip install OpenCV contrib Python headless. I would just go right for the second one because it installs everything. Uh, so it's the full package. And you would just go ahead and open up, uh, in this case, Py38. Um, there's my terminal window, and I can simply do my pip command in here. Um, you can also, if you're in Anaconda, um, we can go in here, let's do all, search the packages for OpenCV. And you can see here's your OpenCV, uh, library OpenCV, Python OpenCV. And I actually installed all of these. All these are installed on my, on my uh, Anaconda for the use of this um, 
setup. Didn't want to miss anything. Uh, and then once we open this up, um, we're going to go in here to new and create a new Python window. Python 3, in this case we're in 3.8 as I told you, which is what's set up in here. And we'll start with just uh, OpenCV uh, General. So let's put that in here. OpenCV. That's just a general setup on there for doing our OpenCV. And uh, of course some people like to I'm not big and looking at my own face the whole time during these, but we'll go ahead and put my video back up there. And when we talk about the OpenCV, uh, we want to go ahead and import all of our different aspects of what we're going to be working on in here. And you'll see on this, uh, we have our import CV2. And I mentioned earlier that a lot of people, when they see the import CV2, they just go ahead and automatically um, do it as CV. That way, if you're using older code, um, it doesn't bother me too much to use CV2, uh, but a lot of people prefer to just keep that as an open. Someday they'll probably have CV3, who knows. Uh, we want our NumPy for our numbers array. Sometimes that comes in. Uh, we have our matplot library, kind of by default, and we'll do our matplot library uh, in line just because we're in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that way, if we do any plotting, it's not really going to affect what we're working on. I just do it as a standard. Uh, pretty straightforward. And then before we get started, let me go ahead and pull over. Um, we have a file set up on here with some images in it and some videos. And just like any of our other um, setups in Simply Learn, if you need a copy of some of these images, of course, it's pretty easy to come up with your own images and your own videos nowadays. Uh, but if you wanted to rerun this and set this up, you can certainly have them send uh, the information over there with, in this case, we have the cat, uh, which is going to be an image. We have a dog, which is going to be an MP4 uh, video. And then we have, uh, when we do facial recognition, we took some of our um, uh, very well-known actors out there, like uh, Ben Affleck, Elton John, the musician, Jerry Seinfeld, and other people. So we can actually train a Keras setup on there and do a um, facial recognition on there. And again, all of this, you can send to Simply Learn and say, hey, can I get a copy of some of this information? Uh, and so we're going to start out, uh, the first thing we want to do is just the most basic thing, which is read in an image and display it. And then I'm going to go ahead and, let's see, uh, I'm going to cut this in half. I, I used to have this in Windows 10 where I just hit a button and it dropped my background and everything. Um, so we're going to look at the horrible blue color of the Windows default. <laughs> um, you'll just have to ignore my icons up there. And so we're going to be reading images. Um, and the reason I did a half screen here is because um, when they pop up, they don't necessarily pop up by default in front in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so you're not even going to see them. They'd be hidden behind there. The first thing we want to do is just a basic reading of an image. In this case, we're just going to read the file cat.jpg. There's no path in here because I went ahead and saved it in the same folder that the program's running in. But if you have it in a separate folder, you'd want to put that full path in there. And so we, it's real simple. We have image, we have cm.im read or read. I, I don't know which one they use. Um, I am read. And then cv im show. And that just stands for image show and cats and then image. Cats is the title of the window that's going to pop up. And let's go ahead and run that. And you can see here we have our window that pops up and there's our cat. Uh, so that's really straightforward. Uh, if you're looking at that, it's, there's nothing really difficult. And this is why I like um, OpenCV so much because it's so easy to use. And if we're going to do the image, if you remember we had dog uh, video going on. Let me move my image up a little bit. There we go. We can go ahead and play a movie. And that is that. That is really cool. And by the way, uh, when I was messing with this, it does actually store the sound file with the MP4. So if you have the video playing and the microphone going, it will store both of those as a second. Uh, there's like another channel that stores in the uh, CV when it's reading these things. In this case, we're going to go ahead and capture. Uh, we need to go ahead and tell it where what file we're capturing. Um, and in the next video, we'll actually do... Um, one of the next two sections will show you how to capture the camera you're actually looking at. Um, but in this one, we have 
capture cb video capture dog.mp4 pretty straightforward it just says here's the file we're going to capture uh, and then it says while true and this if you're doing um, a lot of programming in python you should recognize this uh, instead of setting is true to true and then letting it switch each time uh, we just say hey if not is true break and that will break the um, loop and so what we're doing here is we're going to read each frame of the video as it goes is true frame equals capture dot red um, if is true is false it breaks so we're done we've hit the end of the video and then we're going to show the video in this case of the dog cute little puppy um, and it's going to be by frame so each frame is showing and you see we have a wait key here this has to do with uh, the encode in the back so if, um, you could probably leave it out in here but it's usually good to leave these particular things in um, this particular key in there because it does actually there are times when that can affect the runtime and you can see here's our little puppers you know uh, smiling and having fun uh, <laughs> and it is it's playing each of those frames so as you're watching it uh, it's going through, I don't know how many frames per second, probably 30 frames per second. And so it's displaying 30 frames one after another. Um, and if you have sound with it, it by default will play the soundtrack with there, just so you know. Um, we don't, we're not doing too much in sound on this one that we're just focusing on the open CV video. And then when you're done with something, uh, you'll see me flash this up a bunch of times. We're going to have the destroy all windows from the CV, which closes everything we got going. Um, when we're dealing with videos, one of the issues is you have a buffer in your video. And so you'll see us, you'll see this kind of coding where it says wait key 60. And it's just waiting an extra period of time to make sure everything's cleared out of memory. That's all that does. And so you can see we just closed all the windows that came in on there. And then one of the cool things we can do uh, and we're, we're going to do a bunch of stuff with images in just a minute. But let's start with the video. Uh, we can do resizing. And so we have a uh, rescale the frame. We're going to send it the frame. We're going to send it the scale. And it's going to uh, compute the um, height, uh, the width and the height based on what we send for a scale. We'll put it into dimensions. And this right here is our resize. Um, CF resize the frame, and this could also be an image. It's not, you're not stuck with just a frame when you do this kind of resize. Um, and then they have, this is the code they use for resizing. Not a whole lot to look in there. Um, it does come up sometimes because there are a couple different mathematical codes of how to blend the colors together and make it smaller without it uh, becoming really chunky or really, I mean, they used to just delete. Like if you cut it in half, you just delete every other pixel. And then, of course, you're deleting information instead of melding it together. And this moves it over. That's what this is doing right here, this uh, interpolation equals CV inter area. Uh, and then we have the change the res. Um, we're going to be doing a live video. So um, when you change the, res the resolution, again, there's not a whole lot to look in here. It's just um, uh, helping us so that the resolution keeps it looking nice on there. Uh, and then we have our, this should look familiar from above. We do our capture. We need to set up where the video is coming from. We got to let the CV, the open CV know what the video, which uh, file it's using. And then it says while true. This is again, just like above. Um, if not true, if not is true, break. And here's our frame resize. And then we're going to do uh, CV IM show frame. And then we're going to do CV IM show frame to resize. This would look just like you saw before. And then we have our um, this extra code here in case we need to re break early. Now I'm going to run this and we're going to get, uh, if you have, if you're looking at this, you should say, oh, we have um, two different videos going. One of them is labeled video. And it's based on frame, and one is video resized based on frame. So we're going to end up with two completely separate videos playing at the same time. And let's go ahead and run and see what that looks like. You'll know one of the videos is obviously going to be the dog, because we saw him before. And you can see right here, there the dog is resized. And we could easily take this um, scale 
Here we'll go this way just a little bit. And instead of 0.5, maybe we want to do 0.25 because we want it to be like a little little um, thumbnail on there. Let me run that. And you can see how it nicely rescales it down to a quarter of the size. And then I'm going to keep the split screen. Uh, you'll see why in just a second. Let me go ahead and destroy the windows and clean up our uh, desktop that we're working on. And we're going to go back to image editing. Uh, so we're going to go through a bunch of image different editings you can do on here. Now this next part we're zooming through. Uh, there are so many things you can do with the open CV. Uh, first we're going to just draw a blank box. We'll go ahead and run this. Here's my blank box. It's got nothing in it. Um, and we can take, if you notice I've created blank. Oops, there's my blank. We filled it with zeros. So this is a 500 by 500 by 3 channel. Uh, there's actually, it can be four channels if you have the alpha, which is a see-through. Uh, and this will handle an alpha channel, but you have the three channels in here, and you create a nice blank box that's just blank, black in, the, in there. Uh, and then if we're going to do a blank box, we can actually take, let me go back in here, there we go. We're going to take this blank box, and we're just going to uh, fill it. I'll, I'll leave it called blank. We'll run this, and I'm, I'm putting in from 200 to 300. That's actual pixel counts. So remember, this is a 500 by 500 box. And we're going to do from 200 to 300 and 300 to 400. That's the upper left and bottom right corners of the array. And we're going to send to 00, 0255, which happens to be green. And this is RBG. Um, be a little careful because they, some of the formats switch the order from red, blue, green to different colors. And if we run this, uh, you can see here we've actually added, oh, I guess I did a, um, <laughs> a red box. For some reason, I thought that was a green color. I must have it switched around on there. Um, but you can see right here that we can actually go in and we can change any pixel in here. And it works like a numpy array, which is really nice because now I can edit uh, my blank box here and do different things in the blank box and fill it in there and draw lines. Um, we'll go ahead and do a rectangle. Like I said, the, some of this is going to be quicker to pasting in here and showing you. Um, we're going to take a rectangle and, um, oops, it's hard to see here, create the shape. Let me open this up a little wider. There we go. And in the rectangle, um, we're going to use blank. Um, I'm going to show it. We're going to give it a new window. That's what this is doing down here. If I left this blank, it just put the rectangle on top of everything. And we're going to use blank as our basis, um, starting at 0, 0. And you can see our different dimensions um, and thickness minus 1. And there's my weight key on the bottom. And let me go ahead and run that. Oops, I should have done an IM show. Uh, which it did, but it was behind our Chrome. <laughs> you can set where it appears on the window. We should probably do that on here. Uh, but you can see it opened up a new window. This window is called rectangle. This one's called blank. And so these are two completely different windows that we've set up on here. If I had changed this to blank, it would have just put the rectangle on top, just like it did the um, red square earlier. And we can do a lot with this. We can go ahead and draw, let's see, a circle, a line, and then put some text on here. And we'll take the same blank setup, since that's our basis right here is blank. And we'll go ahead and create all of those. And let me go ahead and paste that in here. And you can see here we have um, our CV circle. It's going in on the blank. Um, we have our dimensions of the circle. Let me just bring these down a line so you can see a little bit better what we're looking at. There we go. Um, and then we're going to do the color on this, the thickness minus 1. And this is uh, basically a, a radius of the circle kind of set up. I'd have to look up to remember the exact um, what these different numbers represent. Um, but you have the, the different sizes of the circle. We have a line here. We're going to draw a line uh, blank. In this case, we have uh, 300, 400, 255. And you can see a setup in here. This is, again, the color, the starting point, the end point, and a thickness of 3. Um, so a lot of this is pretty straightforward, and this is going to open up a new window called line, because that's what we called it instead of putting it on the blank. And then we'll do text. Now, on each one of these, we're adding the line to blank, so it's in the original blank square 
that we've called blank. But on each one of these, we're putting it, opening it up in a new window. We could easily continue to put them in the same window and you could turn it into a video or some other kind of thing. And you can see down here, hello, my name is Jason. My name isn't actually Jason. Um, and we have our location that we're going to print Jason on there and the font and the size and the color and dimensions of it and then show text. And let's go ahead and run so you can see how all these show up on here. And if I open up my screen a little wider, uh, you can see that we have our code and we did certainly put add a circle on here. Here's our circle. We added a line on here. Here's our line and we've added text on here. Hello, my name is Jason. Probably should have picked a different color instead of matching it with the uh, square box we put on there. And just like all of this, uh, we want to go ahead and clear the data. Um, keep a nice clean screen. And I'm not sure why it keeps printing this stuff underneath. I gotta go fix that. And then the next section we want to cover is going to be uh, your grayscales and blending and masking and stuff like that. And let's go ahead and clear our little palette. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> it's a good name for it, palette. And here we go. Uh, you remember this one. We're going to load our image. Uh, in this case, we're going to load the image park and we're going to display park. Uh, we get that nice view of the park. That's what we did before. And there's so many things that are built into OpenCV on here. Uh, one, we can grayscale it. And we're just going to take, and you can see here we're converting um, blue, green, red. Remember I said there's three channels. You got to be a little careful what order they're in. I can never remember. I have to actually pull it up every time I go in here uh, because I jump around between so many editors and software. It's just the nature of dealing with pictures sometimes. But you really have to make sure you catch that and double check it. Um, and so we're just going to, this is just a conversion, and that's what the CVT stands for, color. And then we'll display this in uh, gray, gray skelet. And you can see it did a nice job. There's our park. Oops, if I can grab it. And there's the gray scale on there. And then we can do such things as blur. So I can come in here and we can go ahead and um, this uses CV Gaussian blur. And there's a lot of settings as far as how the blur works. Um, and then you can see here we got border default, uh, CV border default 77. I believe that has to do with the square and the pixel range. Um, when you do a lot of blurring, then you start messing with it. And we can see here's the park up here. Um, we went ahead and grayscaled it. Oops, there we go. Uh, gray not responding because I hit the wrong button on this. And blur. There's our blur on there. Uh, so we have a couple different setups on that. Um, there's also edge cascade. Some of these you just pretty much, you really have to know you're editing on videos. I'm not a huge uh, video editor. So when I do a lot of this stuff, I'm not really sure what it is I'm doing. Um, like I know what blur is obviously, but I don't know what edge cascade is. Uh, except for now that it comes out, you can clearly see that it draws lines dealing with where the different colors meet and how they connect. Uh, that's a really neat tool. It puts a nice mask, it literally creates a nice mask of the edging. And you can see where you could use this to pull out, in this case, the sky quite easily from the whole picture. And there's dilated. Let me go ahead and run that. We can see what that looks like. Oops, give it a second to pop up to the top. And keep in mind that the dilated used the edge um, as our input. So we took um, the canny, the blur. Oh, there we go. Yeah, canny blur. Dilated used the canny. So we have our blurred coming in from the canny edges. Um, quite the terminology there if you're trying to follow it all. We have eroding. Uh, let me just show you some of the settings on there. Um, we have the number of iterations for doing eroding. So let's go ahead and run this one. And you can see how it changes the settings uh, or the view on there. And this brought in the dilated and then eroded it back into, I'm guessing it kind of sharpens it uh, from, the, from the blurriness we saw in the one before at the dilated. Uh, and then, of course, probably one of the ones that I use the most, uh, and I use the resize. And the reason I use this a lot is because I work in data science. And so 
if I have it coming in as a certain size on there, um, if, the, if the neural network is processing an image with a certain size, all the images coming in have to be that size. And so we have here um, resizing our image. And let's go ahead and run that. And you can see how we took the, uh, in this case, we used the original image and we re just resized it to a smaller view on there. And if we can resize the image, uh, we can also crop it. Um, again, data science loves cropping. This is, you could literally um, crop pictures and resize them and rotate them and make that your new import for doing categorization. Uh, and we'll actually show you how we can automate that when we get to the facial recognition caross part of this tutorial. Uh, but we can see here we can also crop it. And we just take the picture and crop a small piece off of it there. And just like we did before, let's go ahead and clean our palette, start it over again. Uh, and again, we're just chugging through these. Uh, these are commands that depending on what you're doing, depends on what you need. So if we're looking at um, changing it to grayscale, uh, sometimes processing something in grayscale and Keras is easier. It's able to pull out the dimensions better. Um, blurring, that's more of a display kind of thing where you're going to display it with a slight blur. Um, finding the edges, that's kind of cool. You can actually come in there and maybe use those edges to help you find something in the foreground and, and in the background. Um, dilated, give it that little blurry look. Um, eroded, bring it back into sharpness. Uh, resize it and crop it. All those are things that are just neat tools to have at your fingertips and easy to use. Some of them might be more for a website and bringing up icons and uh, cropping the headshot or something like that, where others are, are kind of more gen general use in just about any industry. Another feature is uh, being able to translate, uh, transmat float32. Remember a lot of these things, let me just full screen this here real quick. Uh, we have our image coming in and then we can translate it a uh, hundred and hundred in different directions on here. There's so many different things we can do with this. So as we go through this, oh my goodness, I hit a button on here. Okay, give me just a second. There we go. <laughs> okay, so let's go to translate. It's on translate on there. And we have the cat and you can see how we've translated it down instead of the full image of the cat that we had before. Um, we can also rotate. Uh, rotation, like I mentioned earlier, is a fun thing to do. And we'll actually do that when we do the Keras thing because you can process the same image at different angles and then you've just multiplied your input as far as doing an identification. Uh, in this case, you can rotate on here. We have the angle, the rotation point, um, none. I believe it puts it in the center. I'd have to look that up. And then you have uh, the image shape, height, width, uh, rotate point is none, width, height. So this is actually going to put the rotate point in the middle if we send it a none to this little routine that they put together in the back. And then uh, we're going to warp. This is the actual command here, warp a fiend. Uh, and you have the image, you have your rotate map, and you have your dimensions on here. And if we go ahead and plug that in, we put the rotate in um, image at minus 45. Let's see what happens. And we're going to run that. And you can see how it nicely rotated the cat's head, although it's a little creepy the way it looks like it cut the cat's head off on there. Uh, maybe move it, translate it down a notch just so you can't see the, the cutoff point. And we already did the resize, uh, but we'll run that again so you can see how it gets resized on here. And be aware when you resize them. I do a lot of resizing for the putting it into uh, neural networks or into some kind of machine learning setup, uh, but it does squish it. It squishes it and stretches it. And so if you're doing this for, say, display and re-editing, you might want to be a little careful about that. Uh, make sure that you maintain the same ratio unless you intentionally want it to, the, the cat to look taller and thinner. Uh, and then we can also go ahead and flip it. As you can see here, we just flipped it upside down. Uh, minus one. You can probably flip it a couple different ways. I'm curious as to what minus two does. Shoop, same thing. Um, maybe if we put minus and a one is not, well, one is just flipping it all the way to the opposite side from left to right. 
Uh, so you can see here we can flip it around a little bit. That's kind of a fun thing to have. Um, one of those things you might have a hotkey for if you're doing uh, some kind of picture editing and giving a lot of choices. And we also already did the, see, there we go, cropping. Uh, so you can see here where we a cropped image uh, equals the image and we just pick out the pixels we want and then we can show the cropped image over here. And it's just a cropping of the face. In this case, we grab 200 to 400 um, as the upper left corner and 300 to 400 as the bottom right corner. And let's clear our palette again. And then we're going to do um, contour detection. And there is so much that goes into all this. I mean, we're flashing through a lot of things. And you can see how you might combine them and use them for different things. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get our cap back up as our image. And let's go ahead and do... Um, Image shape, we're going to take an image shape and we're just going to create a blank screen for it. Uh, so this is just a blank screen here based on the shape of the cat. And strangely enough, uh, this has done a lot. The reason that we would create a blank thing is you can, or a blank image, is you might start filling in information on there and using that as your template for different things. And so it becomes almost, it becomes a mask of sorts. Uh, there's an actual mask in the program, a little bit different, but you can imagine if this is your blank screen you start with, you might add circles or squares or whatever on there. Um, and we can do the same thing here with, um, we can convert our picture to gray. We did that earlier, which is always kind of fun to see the, the cat comes back. And uh, being that I'm messing with a lot of uh, different feeds and stuff like that, it's... Uh, you can see I got an auto responding going on there. When you do a lot of this stuff, that's what you, you'll start seeing more of that uh, as you mess with it. It'll eventually come in. You just got to give it some time. There it is. There comes in my gray one on there. Um, and we have the Gaussian blur, so we can take it and blur the image. And in this case, we fed it the gray one. So you can see the, the very clear mouth underneath on the gray one and then the more blurry one on top on there. Uh, if you remember, we did earlier, um, come back on here. Canny edges. So again, we're doing detections and things like that and looking for different things. And there's another feature called CV threshold uh, or the thrust CV threshold. And in this case, we're going to send it the gray picture. And let me just pull the coding down here. Um, there we go. And you can see here we're going to do uh, CV threshold based on binary. Um, Let's set up on here and we'll go ahead and just run this so you can see what this looks like. Run. There we go. That's, that's actually really cool how it picks up on that, uh, on the threshold. And you can see how it just turns it into almost a black and white image. That can be a lot of fun too. And we can also look at the contours in the open CV. Uh, so we talk about that. We have our, let me just open this up all the way so we can see the code. Uh, we're going to return the contours and the hierarchies. Um, and we're going to pull this off of canny, uh, the canny one that we sent up up here earlier. And they have the retrieve list and chain approximate sample. So there's a lot of options in here that we can follow. Uh, let's go ahead and run that. Let's go back down here. Where are you? Oh, there we go. And when we run this, uh, we get a nice setup on this. It says, hey, there's 74 contours found on here. Um, and that's, that's actually, uh, turns this, starts turning this into a math on, whoops, which one did we feed it? Uh, we fed it the canny up here. So we start to look at these different setups. Let me get this out of the way. Where's canny? There's canny in the back. And you can see that this drew 74 different uh, like line connections on here. Uh, so now we're starting to actually turn this into almost a mathematical formula on this. And while we're looking at these, we'll go ahead and do uh, draw contours. And here's our um, contour. Let's return the contours up here. And we're going to put this on the blank. Remember how we did the blank earlier? Uh, so we're actually going to take the blank as, remember I told you, you could use it like a, um, 
a base setup on there and we can now redraw the contours but in this case uh, we changed the color uh, so now we're drawing the contours in red so that's just kind of a fun thing you can do on there to, to change the uh, literally change the appearance and the setup on there and let's go of course uh, clean up our setup and destroy all our windows and move on to the next section and we're going to look at color spaces and let's start with uh, in the color spaces we're going to uh, read an image in and I'm going to go ahead and show uh, the image park let me just run that oops I forgot to put a um, the weight key in there a lot of times the weight key just helps because I'm pushing all these graphics out through a single kernel because I'm working in Jupyter Notebook and things get hung up and so waiting that extra 60 milliseconds can sometimes really help uh, sometimes as we start flashing these pictures up and down you'll see there's no response and other things come up that really is just because we're pushing so much out there uh, now one of the interesting things on this is we imported matplot library and so matplot library can now easily be integrated with um, our um, imagery and you can just see all we gotta do is just dump the image into the matplot library and now I have the image here uh, showing on my matplot library setup one of the things you're going to notice on this is the colors all look off well again you see that and you see that they're supposed to be the same thing and you should jump and say oh uh, one of these is RBG and the other is GBR or um, BGR or something like that and so it's reading the the, the um, reading the colors in a different order that's all that means and you have to do a transformation at some point to fix that uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, we'll go ahead and go back and grayscale it again we can take our image of the park uh, we'll put it into gray run there we go and in here we can convert our color and this is what we we're just talking about uh, we can convert the color scheme let me go ahead and run this and you can see here we swapped the scheme out uh, and then I'm curious because we did up here plot it what does this look like when we plot this new color down here uh, this new scheme what does that look like on our setup let me go ahead and just go down there we go and we called this uh, HSV so we'll go down here and instead of image I'm gonna plot HSV and let's run that and still way off on color schemes <laughs> you can see we can really mess up with this hsv is another type of color scheme um, i was curious because i did not think it would come up correctly but i wanted to see if it would and we can also do a conversion to um, uh, what's called there we go uh, bgr blue green red to lab and lab is just another color scheme on here um, and so you can see when we swatch the color screen it has some really cool effects as far as uh, what it looks like in their view uh, lab ranges from it's kind of luminosity and then it has like uh, then the channels coming in uh, so it's a little bit different setup on this but it, really you have to just play with these to see what they look like and we talk about all these different color schemes and all these switches on here now the one that we were talking about earlier I mentioned was the BGR to RGB because we use the BGR we'll just run this and we see the color change on that and then we'll go back up because I'm still curious um, okay there we go copy if this is the same that matplotlibrary uses and we'll just type in RGB down here because that's what we called our figure and we'll run this and it will display it oops it comes up there and gives us a problem because capitalization <laughs> whoops <laughs> RGB there we go so let's go ahead and run that and that looks pretty close to the original uh, so this is when we're converting between matplot library and from the open CV we really want the blue green red to red green blue that's the conversion you want to use to get to the original picture on there 
And then we can also convert from um, HSV to the lab. Like I said, these, these conversions, you have to look them up most of the time, but it's important to start recognizing them. So the very fact that you're in here looking at this, and we're talking about blue, green, red versus lab um, versus the, um, where was it, H, uh, HSV set up on there. When you're dealing with pictures, they come in in all varieties. And so really being able to switch between them is important on here. So let's go ahead and take that particular setup, conversions, and we'll go ahead and clean up our palette. Hopefully that will save us some problems down the road. And we're going to start looking at the color channels. Uh, and with this, we'll go ahead and reload the park back up. Um, we'll display that just so you can remember what the original picture looked like. Um, and then for right now, let's go ahead and take a blank screen and create ourselves a blank zero. It's basically same shape as our uh, park image. Um, D type uh, U integer eight. Don't really usually that's the default anyway, so you don't really need to even put that in there. But it's good to have. And this is an interesting line here that OpenCV allows you to do uh, CV split image. And this basically just takes the three channels in your NumPy image, and you could use the NumPy code and figure it out, I'm sure, and splits it into blue channel, green channel, and red channel. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, um, there we go, uh, we're going to do a CV merge, blue, green, and red. And what we're doing is we're merging the uh, blank one as far as blue, the blank, green, blank, uh, blank, blank, red. So these are the new channels as we combine them. That's what this uh, merge thing does. This is kind of fun because you could merge, you could take like your cat with just the red whiskers merge that with something um, and then kind of mess with the images as to far as like you know what sticks out and what sits back on there you can get pretty creative with the um, uh, imagery and then we're just going to go ahead and show blue green red uh, we'll just do all these at once and you can see here um, the same image oops there we go i'll take it a second to pull it down and we can now see uh, it's either black or blue, red or blue, or, you know, the different colors in here, green or black. Kind of fun. I mean, you can really pull out the different colors and see how you can mess with them on there. Um, and then if we go ahead and um, just do a quick print of these shapes, we go run. Uh, you can see here that, as you expected, uh, you have the image shape, which is 427, 640 by 3. Well, it's only 640 by 640, so each one of these is just the color of just the one color. That's all we're showing on here. The fact that we used the shape on here is very similar to your NumPy, and these are actually NumPy in the back end. Uh, so if you haven't messed with NumPy, um, real powerful setup on there. You can dive in there and do a lot of stuff in NumPy that comes back right into this over here. And then we'll merge them back in. Shoop. There we go. And we see the original picture. Give it a second to pop to the front. And you see here we merged the colors back. We separated the colors. We merged them back. Same image. And that's what we expect on this because we didn't mess with any of the colors. Let's go ahead and destroy all that. So we have another clear setup. And let's go in and look at uh, some more alterations we can do with um, blurring and, and altering the image in different ways. For this, we'll go back to our cat picture. Uh, here's our image, CV, I am red, cat JPEG. And if we run that and view it, there's our cat. Um, I guess we got tired. I guess the guys in the back got tired of the cute puppy running around. <laughs> and the first thing we'll go ahead and give a shot on here is uh, averaging. These are different ways we can blur the image. Uh, so if we average it, uh, it takes the average pixels based on uh, three by three. And if we change this to 30, just for fun, um, you can see how it really blurs it on there. Uh, so this is like a 30 by 30 pixel. Each pixel averages around it. Uh, we'll go back to 10. Kind of a little bit of fun stuff you can do on there. And you can see that because I'm doing the average blur, it knows to go to this frame right here. That's why I can so easily jump in here and just make some changes on that. 
Um, that is a lot of fun when you're messing with videos because you can so easily throw that into um, your interface set up on there and be able to mess with it. And here's our Gaussian blur. And the Gaussian blur is very similar, uh, but the pixels that are closer are given more weight. And let's, let's just jump this up here to 30. We'll run that. And whoops, it didn't like 30. I guess I jumped too high for it. Uh, let's do uh, let's do five. There we go. Uh, you start to see the blurring on there. And then the one, let's change that and see what that does. Doesn't make a huge difference on this until you start messing with, let's see, weighted. There we go. Run. Uh, you start to see it starting to blur more and more depending on how we do the weight and how it kind of blends outward. Gaussian's nice because it adds a little bit more blending to it where this just blurs it, where the average just blurs it out. Uh, again, those are the kind of things you, you almost have to play with them a lot to start seeing how they change. And there's also the medium blur. Uh, let's go ahead and run that one as it comes up. There we go. Uh, and the median works almost identical to the average. Uh, it's very similar on there. There are some differences. And you really have to start looking at what is the difference between an average and a median value. Because uh, that's what this is based on. This is based on the median value. If we do a run 10, there we go. There's our median. Oh, it didn't like the 10. I'm not sure why. I must have been too high of a value for it. Uh, run. Oops. Let's try 0.5. There we go. Um, okay, so, and this has to be an integer for the medium blur. And you can see it's similar to the average, um, but there is a difference in the way the math actually functions in the background. Uh, sometimes it comes out a little different. And there's also a bilateral filter. A lot of these you use to smooth um, sharp edges. If something looks really sharp, you can smooth it. And this is literally what they're doing when they say smooth something and you're messing around with um, Photoshop. These are the kind of changes that are happening in the back end. Uh, and then we have our bilateral. Let me go and run that. And the bilateral, uh, you should, that is one that's really important to remember uh, because it, it works like the Gaussian, but it, it's like a Gaussian filter on top of a Gaussian filter. And one Gaussian filter smooths out like uh, blotches, like if you want someone to have smooth skin, but keeps the sharp edges. Uh, and so when you're messing with this and you're doing a lot of work, remembering the bilateral filter is really important if you're doing images, especially uh, if you look at my complexion, I really need it. I should be doing the bilateral on that one. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you'd be using to really bring up people's features while smoothing out all that fuzzy noise that shows up on their skin and blemishes. And again, let's go ahead and clear our palette. Run. Another cool feature uh, is that we can do bitwise setup on here. And I'm going to create a blank setup um, just so you can see what it's going on there. Here's our blank box, 400, uh, 400, 400. Um, and it has a rectangle we're going to do from the blank copy, and then we're going to do a circle. Um, the circle is going to be uh, 200, 200 set up on here. So we're just building a circle and a rectangle like we did before. Let me just show you all the numbers on there so you can see what we're doing. Oops, let me maximize it. All right, there we go. Let me, uh, always a question, do you do it before or after the comma? Uh, it really depends on what I'm working on and who I'm working with. I do whatever they want. <laughs> so if it's uh, sometimes it looks nice to have the commas in front, and sometimes afterwards when you're splitting rows, it's purely visual on here. Uh, so we're going to have we're going to go ahead and do build ourselves a rectangle and a circle here, and let's just go ahead and display those so we can see what those look like. Uh, so we're just going to show our two images. These images are based on the blank, so they're the same size as far as the image goes. And that's important when you're working with bitwise. Um, so how do you overlap two things if you don't know which, which parts are overlapping so they have to be the same size? And we can see over here, let me just pull this over, uh, we have our rectangle and our circle. 
And we can do just like we do with um, any kind of bitwise functionality. And let me pull it, I guess, see if I can pull it over here without losing uh, information on the screen. I always wish the screen was uh, 10 times bigger than it ever is. It doesn't matter how big my screen is. Uh, so here we have the uh, bitwise and. This is where the two regions intersect. And it's like you expect. You can see the white circle on the square, but where they where they're both at, but not where um, uh, uh, the black part is. So it's only, it's the and. They have to have both white on both the square and the circle. And just like that, we can also do the or. And hopefully your mind's already jumped ahead. If we're doing the or, CV bitwise or, rectangle and circle, uh, we have the combination of the two as if you just pasted one over the other in this particular case. And we have uh, nor, or zor as it's called, control V. Um, so it's not X nor uh, or not Y. And if you look at that, that kind of makes a pretty pattern on there. Not X, not Y. Not X and Y, not not. <laughs> but that's the zor on there. You can see how the zor comes up on there. Uh, and then, of course, there's just the bitwise knot on there. We'll go ahead and run that one. And you can see here where the knot set up on that. In this case, it just inverses the circle from uh, black to white. And just like before, let's go ahead and clear our palette. So we start with a clean palette over here. Also keeps my computer running smooth. Uh, and we have, we're now into masking. Oh my gosh, I use masking so much. Um, and if you go into any program out there uh, that does any kind of editing, masking comes up. Uh, so we want to go ahead and work with our masking on this. And for masking, let's bring the cat back. Um, this here is a cute cat. In this case, we have a bunch of cute kittens. Uh, in fact, a bucket of cute kittens. That's a little scary. Uh, and we'll go ahead and create a blank page on here. And this is really interesting. In fact, I'm going to stop here and actually do um, a draw. And I want you to notice right there, whoops, right there is the two, uh, the shape. And this is a numpy shape. So what are we talking about with this numpy shape? Well, this numpy shape is zeros or ones. We're really looking for a um, black and white image. A lot of times we talk about masks, we're talking about true-false. Uh, and that is the same as in NumPy, like a true-false mask, just like you have in NumPy. And we'll go ahead and create the blank image over here. And it's just like you'd think, it's uh, black. And then we can easily do both the um, circle and rectangle. And you can see here we did an image shape. Um, yeah, this isn't too important right now because we're going to create the mask separately in just a second. Uh, but you can see where we're creating um, our image here. There we go. So you can see all the different things in the window. And it's going to create both a circle and a rectangle mask on here. And let's go ahead and do a uh, bitwise. Uh, we're going to create the mask out of the bitwise, out of the circle and the square. We'll go ahead and run that so you can see what the mask looks like. And in fact, let's let's go back to... Let's clear up our um, things. It gets, our um, palette here, we'll just go run that. Um, we're going to play with the, let's see, where are the kittens? Got to have our cute kittens on our display. There we go, there's our kittens come back. Okay, our bucket of kittens. <laughs> that cracks me up, a bucket of kittens. Uh, and here's our mask run. You can see we have an interesting mask showing on there. And then I'm going to, we're going to take and uh, combine these. Let's see, here we go. And we're going to do a bitwise where we have the image, the image, and mast equals mast. Uh, so here's a bitwise setup on here. And let's see what that looks like. And that, it's just kind of fun. I, I've created this mask, adding all these things together. And you can see how uh, easily we can actually just kind of zero in there and show just the kitten on the mask. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And you could also reverse this and have an image without the kitten on there and just a black hole where the cat was. Uh, so those are both things that can happen on here. Let's go ahead and clear our setup. And masks can get so complicated. You can see we added two masks together, a square and a circle, and got a half circle on there. 
Um, I tell you, I've, I've gotten into so many layers of masks that I can't even track what's going on anymore. Um, so you got to be a little careful with your masks and how you add them together and bring them together. Uh, but there's a lot of things you can do with them. You could just as easily swap the green channel in for one. Um, so you have just certain areas where you have like just a circle or it's just green or maybe the whole background is green and one area is actually full color. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things. Or you could mask, uh, take the mask of the, um, of a black and white image and then mask a section of it in color. I've seen that done to make some really cool photo, uh, photographs. Histograms, not something I normally think of when dealing with uh, photographs, but you can do a histogram of the information on there. Uh, so let's bring back the kittens because they're just so cute. And let's uh, gray scale it. Bring them back in our gray scaled cats. And then what we can do with this is we can go ahead and do a grace a histogram on the grayscale. Boy, we can get so much into histograms because histograms have so much cool data that you can bring in. Uh, so a lot of times you can take images of something, you can start looking at the number of pixels, uh, the bins that they fall in, different setups as it pulls in. But you can see we have a grayscale, the histogram of the grayscale here. And just like we do the grayscale, we can also do a histogram of the colored scale too. Boom, there we go. And the same setup, we got our plot figure, our title, we're just doing a histogram. We're just gonna throw in the colors, uh, blue, green, red. Um, and then we just go through each of the colors and we go ahead and mask them and then plot them on here. Let me just pull that over so you can easily see what's going on. And the same thing with the grayscale. All we did was come in here and just drop the grayscale right on here um, with the setup. And so we have our figure, our bins, and a number of pixels. And if we plot the red uh, um, histogram of the colors, uh, you can see here some really kind of fun patterns. And you could analyze these patterns on different things to, I don't know about kittens. Um, I don't really think of kittens with histograms. I don't really, wouldn't really do a histogram of a cat. Uh, but you could see if this image was like a heartbeat image or something like that, the histogram would really be showing and telling you exactly what's going on. And we'll keep the cute kittens up there and look at thresholding. Uh, so we have the threshold, the thresh, and the, you can do a threshold on here. As far as, uh, there we go. Let me just bring that down so you can see some of the numbers that go into there. And we're going to use the grayscale and just do a simple thresholding view on here. And what we're looking at is the colors that come forward. Uh, you can do different thresholds on different colors. Um, and here we're just saying, hey, if it's, because uh, uh, we're dealing with grays, if the certain color is over 150 or 255, you can see we have a nice, or if it's over 150, then it just turns it black, otherwise it's white. And so we create a nice threshold. And you could actually turn around and use this as a mask back on the original picture, and it would bring the cats out and make some interesting pictures on there. Uh, but that's a basic threshold on there. Uh, there's what they call an inverse threshold. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what that looks like, so you have an idea. We'll run this. And this is just, uh, you'll see right here, up here we had threshold gray, very similar. Uh, but when we get down to, there we go, uh, thresh binary uh, inverse, there's the key that changes it. So it's still a, th it's still a thresh in inverse equals the same uh, uh, call, the same module CV threshold, it's just how do we process it on the end. And if we run that, uh, if you guessed that an inverse means inverse, then you are correct. Oh, give it a second to pop back up here on top. There we go. Uh, so very similar to the original thrush inverse, but opposite. And also makes for kind of a cool picture. You could imagine uh, uh, taking either one of these and doing some cool things with them over the original pictures. And then finally, there's an adaptive threshold on here. Uh, and the adaptive threshold, let me just pull that over here. There we go. Uh, it doesn't quite show up on this. 
Uh, we have adaptive threshold Gaussian, so we're going to use the Gaussian. If you remember, Gaussian means that it is uh, uh, slow to bring it up. Um, slow, that's not even quite the right word. Um, there we go. Okay, uh, I wanted to bring that over so you could see a little bit better. Uh, Gaussian means it's adaptive, so that the weight closest to the pixel is very different than as you get further and further away as far as adaptive threshold. Um, and then the adaptive is based uh, more on the difference between the pixels as opposed to the grayness on there. And let's go ahead and we run it. Let's take a look on this and see what that looks like. And we can see just quite the wild imagery. Again, it almost makes it like a, um, a black and white etch etching or something like that. So it has a really cool effect. Uh, so a lot of these things are designed to help find edges, which is our next section we're going to go over is um, uh, pulling out the edges and finding the edge detection. And so you can see how complicated it is. It's not an easy thing to find the edges on these pictures. What is the edge? What are the colors? How do you find that? With the histogram we saw in the color scheme, how they did a certain setup, and you might be able to pull that information and use it to find an edge. Um, and so there's a whole thing on edge detection. And this is so central to a lot of stuff being worked on now because, well, let's face it, if you're doing like any kind of imagery, you want to know where the edges are so you can draw a box around it, whether you're trying to uh, program it to do a facial recognition, as we'll do in the third section we're going to cover. We're in the first section. Um, but let's go ahead and bring back our park, run that. Uh, and we're also going to do a nice gray picture on here. Oops, let me put um, the white key back in there. I don't know why it does not. When I run it without giving it that extra 60 milliseconds or whatever to um, pull it in there, it sure gives me a lot of problems on, on this machine. And again, it's because I'm doing the Jupyter Notebook. Um, I, when I put this into a widget or something like that and start using OpenCV or use it as a backend for code, I don't see these kind of problems. It has a lot to do with just using it in Jupyter Notebook. And so let's start with the uh, uh, Sobel, uh, the Sobel X or um, the Sobel line detection on here. Uh, we're going to put in our grayscale setup on here. Um, there's a lot of different settings on the Sobel X, Sobel Y and combine them back together. Uh, so let's go ahead and take that. And we want to go ahead and show, oops, I forgot to bring my shows over. And I'm doing Sobel first. And the reason I wanted to do Sobel first is because the other one is based on the math behind Sobel uh, that we're going to hit the, the second one, which is a, um, which happens to be the uh, Laplacian. And so this works on the intensity from one pixel to the next. And it kind of creates a formula for it. And as you can see, as we get into the intensity from one setup to the other, let me bring this down, uh, we can start to see some lines in here. And we have from the Y direction and the X direction, and we combine them, and you can see there's an interesting kind of pattern set up in here. Now, for a scene like the park, it's not really pulling it in that good. Um, and like I said, each one of these has a different strength to it. Um, with this one, you might do images a little bit better, uh, close-up shots. Uh, but let's look at the Laplacian. Now, the Laplacian is very similar to how it works in the background as the Sobel, as far as intensity. But you take that formula for generating the intensity on there, and, um, whoops, what happened there? <laughs> okay, uh, we take the intensity for the Laplacian. There it is. And they use the second derivative. And you can see how it really transforms the edges on this image. And there's a lot of things we could do with this. If you remember from earlier, we talked about taking out noise, blurring, um, if you use some of those features on here, like the foreground would just disappear with the right blurring technique or the right transposition technique. And it really becomes an art form uh, trying to jump between all these. 
and figure out which one's going to work for your picture and your setup on there. Um, and then you, you run the histogram to kind of maybe find some, try to find a mathematical thing behind it. It's really a challenge to take the background out or bring the background in and sort those things out. And all these tools uh, are slowly being built, and that's what OpenCV works so good, uh, just because to just to address that. And then we already did the canny setup. We'll go ahead and run the um, line detection under canny. And the canny literally combines all of the different math functions of our um, of the uh, Laplacian and the Sobel setup. And you can see here it does a really good job of drawing lines and putting in areas on there. Uh, and again, this is just a, a starting point. Um, one of the cool things you can do with here is blur it and then like get rid of the um, bumps in the beginning and clean it up and do all kinds of things to create a mask on there. And let's go ahead and clean up our screen or pictures and images. And then we're going to dive into uh, the next, the second step stage of this, which is motion detection. Now we covered a huge amount in all these tools uh, that they have on there from our canny edge detection to um, bitwise mapping to um, masking. That's a lot of stuff to cover. Some of those tools we're going to use in the next setup or the next two, one of the next two setups. Uh, but we're going to start with motion detection, uh, which is kind of fun. If you have a, a web camera or you have, um, there's all kinds of reasons you could use it, an outdoor webcam. That's my, what I've always wanted to put one up there to, because I live up in the mountains. It'd be fun to track the animals going by. Uh, but you could also use the motion detector to track somebody coming into an area and then do facial recognition on them. Uh, so you can see the motion detector has a lot of cool tools on there. And the fact that we're going to grab from the camera uh, is really helpful also. So let's go ahead and go in here and open up a new, let's see, new Python 3. And we'll go ahead and rename this real quick. Uh, open CV motion detector. There we go. So Let's dive into our uh, motion detector, and there's so many. We're going to actually use a lot of the tools we looked at earlier. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and start by importing our um, OpenCV, and we went ahead and just did OpenCV2. Remember last time I said sometimes we leave it as CV or import um, CV2 as CV and so on. We're just going to import it as CV2 in this one. And we're going to do date time for tracking. Um, we have this thing called static back. It's a, uh, um, we want to be able to reset something to none. And so having it as a global variable here makes sense. And then I'm going to have current motion and motion list. And what it is is a current motion is going to have a start time and an end time. That's when it detects a motion going on. And then the motion list is just going to keep tagging those on. So we have a new one and an ending one. Now we're looking at a, a lot of code here. So the first piece of code that's um, I really want to draw your attention to is this one right here. Um, CV2 dot capture video. Um, and then the number is if you had multiple videos in here, you can actually capture actually capture the video off the different video cameras. And so we're looking for the main default one um, that's going to be set up in here. This is actually kind of cool because I always had the idea of having uh, the front facing camera and a side facing camera so that you could flip between them and do different things as far as the final edit and that kind of thing. Uh, but this is the video. It's looking at this camera. We're just setting this up right now uh, for which camera to look at. Now, when we're dealing with video, uh, we're kind of creating an infinite loop. And so at some point we have to put a break in it. And we'll, we'll do that. We'll show you that break here in a second. In fact, uh, I'm going to skip between the two um, and skip the code in the middle so you can see the beginning and the end. And so we have an infinite while loop and we're going to, we're going to stack images as the video goes and display them. And then when we get to the end of this infinite while loop, we need a way out. Um, in other words, you don't want it just to go on forever until you hit the escape key. You could do that if you want. Uh, but we like to actually add something in there. 
And we'll go ahead and do, here we go, this. Um, we're going to tag on the end here uh, key weight, uh, key Q2, and then just break. Now, this won't work like this unless we're actually displaying a video and that video screen is highlighted. All this does says is if we are active in the active video screen when we do the display, when we get to that, uh, break. Now I kind of jumped ahead because we actually have to create a display in the middle, but I wanted to put this all together so you could see it all in one shot here. Uh, we have our while loop we're working with. We are going to go ahead and initiate our frame outside of here. It says, hey, this is video. Whenever I do video, this is what we're looking at. Then we're going to read the video and you'll have two returns on here, check and frame. And the frame is nothing more than the image coming in. That's what that is. And the check is, hey, is, do we have an image coming in? Um, if you remember from earlier when we played the dog video, it came up with check would come out false when you got to the end of the video. Because this is an indefinite loop, we never do anything with the check. Uh, we don't have to worry about that too much. So here's, here's our kind of our, our wrapper and we're going to add a couple more things before the end of the break on this. Uh, and then we're going to initialize our motion. Uh, so up here I initialized the current motion as having nothing in it. Uh, so this is a current motion. There's no action going on. We haven't started an action. There's no end to the action. Uh, and then when these fill up, we'll put them into the motion list. And so we're going to go ahead and add in our motion equal to zero. So we're initializing the motion in the loop. And it starts out and says there's no motion going on. <clears throat> now, we're going to go ahead and do some fun stuff here. And this stuff comes, these next lines of code come off of what we just went over. We're going to grayscale it. Uh, very straightforward. So whatever's coming in the camera is going to have a grayscale to it. And then we're going to do a Gaussian blur. This makes it easier to find the changes. Um, we're looking for sharp edges that are moving. That's how we're going to do our motion detector. And if everything's a little blurry, that means the edges are going to stick out when they move uh, because everything, because they're kind of blurring it to those edges. And then we're going to go ahead and do a uh, if static back is none, static back equals gray. So we're going to assign our very first value to the first frame that comes in. That's all this is doing on here. Uh, and then continue on there. Now, I'm kind of zipping through these steps. I'm going to go back through them in just a second so that you'll make a little bit more understanding as we go. Uh, a difference between static background and the current frame, which is a Gaussian blur, uh, so we want the difference between the two frames. And this is just kind of a fun abstract way of finding, hey, what's the original frame and how much has it changed? And then if there's a change, and you're going to hopefully already have guessed that there's some problems with this piece of code right here. Um, and I've run into this. What if your image is your uh, outdoor cam and the grass is blowing in the wind? or the lighting changes because the sun rises and sets. So it might work great in a room that has consistent lighting, not so good for a wilderness cam. And you've got to start thinking about these things, and there's ways around it. Um, and if there's a change between the static background and the current frame is greater than 30, it will show white color. So this is kind of fun. Well, here's our first threshold. We're looking for a threshold between the background and the foreground. Uh, so we're starting to find a little bit there on the setup. And then we're going to go ahead and take uh, our threshold frames, the difference from the background and the foreground. And we're going to put that into um, the thresh uh, frame copy <laughs> into a find contours. And we're going to use the chain approximate sample for finding the contours. So this is going to find some contours for us. And then what we want to look at is on the contours, so we're counting lines. We're counting how many contours or how many lines are in here. And if there's over 10,000 of these lines that are the difference between the initial frame and the new frame, then the motion's going to be one. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. 
Uh, so let's go back up here and just go over that real quick, because I, I did each line as we went in there. First thing we're doing is we're converting it to gray. Why? It's easier to see gray. You can see the differences and movements and things like that in gray a lot better than in color. Uh, next, we're going to blur the gray. This just makes it so it's easier to see um, the changes going on. We've reset our static back to none, so we initialize our background to gray. Uh, so if it's none, then we want the static back to be um, whatever the gray value is of our first frame. So when I turn the camera on, I'm going to be outside the camera, so you can see the back wall of my office, which is um, still under construction. Just a wall socket and some weird stuff back there. Um, and that's what I'm going to use for my basic setup, and then when I go back in and move around, or actually I'll just be in it and just try to hold still and move around a little bit. Uh, and then we have the difference between the static background and the gray frame. So this is the gray frame coming in versus the static background. And then we take that and we make our threshold. And we basically create a bunch of uh, lines. We find the contours of the threshold, the difference between those. And so that's where we get our nice lines. And if we have enough lines on there, then that means we have a motion equals one. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Motion equals one. So the next stage is if we have a motion equals one, we want to track it. And so uh, we'll go ahead and do that here. Just throw that one in. And it says, hey, if this is a motion equals one, and our current motion that we're looking at and our zero slot has nothing in it, and the motion equals one, then we want to go ahead and stamp the date time in there. Uh, so now we're tracking the start of movement. We have the beginning of movement. And we can do a bunch of really fun things. And th this next part we're going to use um, for a bounding rectangle. And this is going to come up in a display we're going to show you in a second. This, this one like, you know, tracking the current motion, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. You can, you, if it's either zero or one, really looking at the contour area and figuring out how much value to put this at. We put it at 10,000. That's really part of the open CV. Another thing with the open CV is we're going to start looking at these contours and we're going to create a rectangle around them. And then CV2 rectangle, um, we're just going to take the frame and write a rectangle right on top of that frame. Now, if for some reason uh, I stop moving, we want to know about that. So now we've created a rectangle around movements. We've detected our motions. If it didn't detect any motions and there's nothing going on, then we want to go ahead and take and append uh, the end time. So if motion equals zero and current motion equals of zero is not equal to an empty set, then we've had movement going on and the current motion of one needs to equal the date time. We'll go ahead and just tag the current motion right on top and then the current motion is reset to an empty set. So that's all it is, is we're just creating an array of the motions. And this is just kind of fun right now. Um, we're gonna go ahead and do Displaying the images. We'll start with uh, image gray frame. And there's our gray on there. And if you remember up here, we drew a box on it. So you're going to start seeing the rectangle um, on the frame <coughs> coming in. And then we're going to go and display, start displaying the gray frame because we converted everything to frame. We want to go ahead and display the differential. So you can see what we're, what's going on in there and why that looks different. And we want to display both the um, threshold frame and the color frame. So we're going to do all of these up here. There we go. Okay. So we basically are showing up everything that we've put together so that it's going to show up on the screen in little boxes. Uh, and then we have our key weight. And I said I need to fill some more stuff in here. Well, if we're in the middle of detection of motion and I hit the Q button, it'll be nice to know that. It'd be nice to tag that on to the end. So we'll go ahead and tag that on to the end here. And if motion equals one and current motion of zero is not equal to an empty set, then current motion of one equals date time now. 
and motionless append the current motion. And then break. That takes us out of the loop completely. And then once we hit the break, uh, we'd like to see what's going on with our motion list. That's what it's all about, is the motion list. So we'll do a quick display on our motion list. Um, I don't want to go past 30 if I do too many start and stops. This is important. Let me go ahead and highlight this right here. We want to release the video and, of course, destroy all our windows. Okay, and that's just cleaning up. Always good to clean up on there. Um, and these are nothing more. Let me go back up to the top. Here we go. Uh, we've already talked a lot about the show. Um, so we're showing the gray frame that we created. We're showing the difference frame that we created. We're showing the threshold frame. And then we're showing the actual uh, color frame that's actually coming in, the frame that's coming in. So, wow, that's a lot to break down. Let's go ahead and run it. Hopefully I didn't miss something when I was coming over here. And we should see it coming through. It's setting up. It's accessing the window. And I have to minimize it because it's behind it. And there we are. Still moving. There we go. Move back and forth. And this is kind of cool because you can see as I move back and forth, look at the lines around my face. Um, especially on the um, uh, 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 difference frame. You can see where it's putting nice contours on there and setting it up. So I need to go ahead and click on one of these boxes because I moved the mouse on the other one and then we'll push the Q button. And then we'll bring back up our um, open CV. And you can see here every time I start and stop, it puts a start time and an end time. And we could have easily put the frame count. You can put just about anything you want on there. And I wanted to go ahead and run this one more time. And then move. And hold still. And then click on and then go ahead and hit the Q. And we can see here that instead of having, um, there we go, boom, that it, it, it picked up on a number of different start and stops on here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven start and stops. So not bad. You know, a little motion detector. Um, again, you can see up here where we're capturing the video. We're looping through and finding the video on each one. And then we do all of our fun transformations on creating the grayscale and Gaussian blur. Um, anything to make it cleaner as far as counting up the uh, threshold lines to see whether we should make it a motion or not. And then, of course, we tack the, emo the motion on there. Um, we added these little boxes around the contours. That was kind of fun because you could see as I moved how it changed and there's still like this weird blur in the background. Uh, and then, of course, if we stop, it, it tags on an end value. And here's all of our displays. And voila, we have a motion detector. Uh, or at least a start to one. you got to mess with it a little bit. And there's Obviously, you might want to do like every... Um, one of the tricks that I use is where you have the static right here is we revert to the gray static view. This one is if it's, um, you might just revert this to a new frame every so many frames, uh, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of lots of play in here that you can do with this. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. That puts us on the demo, which is facial recognition. So let's go ahead and create a new, whoops, where's our new? There we go, new uh, Python 3. And you could see how you can combine the motion detector with the facial recognition detector. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things we can do here. This will be um, cross open CV facial recognition, recognition, rename. There we go. And so to start with, uh, let's go ahead and import our information on here. We're going to import our CV2 as CV. Again, this is a personal preference. I go back and forth on this. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to do it this way if they update it and it's backward compatible. If it's not backward compatible, that's going to cause problems. Uh, but that's going to be fine. 
we have a lot of files going on with this. So as we start messing with the Karas and you want to have access to these files, um, let us know. We can send you, um, you know, compress them down and send them. Just put a note into the, um, send a note over to the Simply Learn team and they can help you with that. So the first thing we're going to start with is the beginning. We have face detection. Um, We've got a picture of a lady, a group of five people image. Uh, we have a grayscale, grayscale of the people. Um, let's go ahead and run. We'll go ahead and move this off to the side again like we've been doing. And run it. There we go. And of course it appears right behind here. Move it off to the side. And give that a second to pull in. As of now, we haven't done anything. As you can see, we just have two blank gray screens. Now, because these aren't loaded all the way, if you try to exit out of them, uh, they'll just kind of lock the system up with it when you're connected with the Jupyter Notebooks. So we want to go ahead and just destroy all the windows. We run that and see that they are gone. And so we have our two our um, uh, gray people gray. <laughs> Those are gray boxes. That's what the gray people are in there. And we're going to bring in the, it's called a cascade classifier. And when you look at the cascade classifier, um, it's going to load the XML har face file right there. This is real important. This is all pre-built. It's looking for edges that are common in faces. That's what this means. When you look at the har face XML, like it's looking at the edges is what it's doing. There is all kinds of really fun stuff they have. Let me just bring this over from the GitHub. This is the OpenCV data har cascades um, GitHub. And if you go into here, uh, you can see we have eyes. Uh, let's see, what is this? Eye tree with eyeglasses, frontal cat face. I guess a lot of people like to identify their cat in photos. Uh, frontal face, frontal face. So there's a lot of different full body, left eye, right eye. Um, there's a Russian numbers. You can also create your own. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with an H, uh, with a HAR cascade file. We're going to load that up specific to detecting faces in here. So that's what this part is about. Let's go ahead and apply that. Uh, and so you can see we create a faces rectangle, uh, har cascade detect multi scale. We're going to put our gray into there, the what we, where we loaded the picture in there. And then it has some uh, scale factor, many neighbors. There's a lot of different things you can do with this. A lot of times these are very, pretty much the default. Um, default works pretty good on a lot of this stuff. And then if you want to dig in deeper into why one would work more, why you need more information, um, you can go back into the open CV, but it's good to know about the, the HAR cascade detect multi-scale. And then when we're processing these, the first thing we want to know is we want to print um, how many number of faces found. You want to make sure we're not looking at a crowd of 500 people with you know a ton of different faces on there. And just because, let me go and put this back up here, just because uh, we like to see, we like to have a view of it, we're going to go ahead and create, um, uh, uh, square it off so it, so it has just the face in there, create the face rectangle, and then we're going to go ahead and show those images. Um, I'm like, if you're like me, I like to see what I'm looking at. Uh, so let's go ahead and run this. And when we run this, let me go ahead and put this back into half screen. Uh, the first thing we do is you notice that number of faces found is one. Uh, that's really what we're looking for is we want to make sure there's just a single face on here. And you can see here, uh, there's our group of five people that says it's actually just one person that found in there. Um, again, you can see it has a nice image of the person coming up in the different scales and colors. And this is the one we really want to look at, as you can see right here, as it puts a rectangle right around the face. This is really nice because now if you are processing this, you're processing the face, or maybe you're processing the background. It could be used for either one to pull the background out from the face and blur it, or take the face and center it. So there's a lot of different things you can do here. If you know this is a face, and then you remember from previous, we did edging, you can now draw an edge and find that edging around her head, knowing that the center of the face where her nose is, and then you can blur the background. You'll see that in a lot of uh, 
newer Zoom and uh, WebEx kind of things where they blur the background out so people can't see what's behind you when you're on one of those meetings. Now we're going to go ahead and clear this. Uh, again, this thing is set up in Jupyter. Um, there's ways to get around this, but for the most part, it's just good to clean up after yourself because we're um, extending it out there. So we'll go ahead and destroy all the windows. The next two steps, or our final two steps, are to go ahead and create a model and train it. So we want to train our model and then actually apply it, um, use it for something. And we're going to go in here, let me just pull this up. And what we got here is we have um, our people. We're going to look at pictures of Ben Affleck, Elton John, Jerry Seinfeld, Madonna, uh, Mindy Kaling. These are really easy to pull up images because these are you know, famous actors. Um, I don't recognize any of them. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I actually know all of them. Um, and we've got it in here. We've got it set up uh, in one of the files. And we're just going to print the directory. So you can take a quick look at that and see what we're looking at here. Um, this is a, where it goes to. Let me go ahead and pull that up so you can see what the actual files look like. And you can see here is um, coming, drilling down into it. Let me just go under Ben Affleck and you can see it's all these pictures. So this is what we're looking at is different headshots of Ben Affleck on here. One of the things to notice is that at some point we probably need to resize because some of these photos are a little bit wider, a little bit taller. And that squishes things and expands them. Uh, so a lot of these detections, when we're starting looking at faces, is actually doing its best to um, do the same thing, compress and expand them into, um, and train it on that, those different shapes. And we'll go ahead and load our um, HAAR HAAR cascade back in here with our face XML that we had before. Um, being that we're in Jupyter Notebooks, it's probably still listed in there. We want to go ahead and um, create an empty array of features and an empty array of labels. And we'll show you what that does here in just a minute. This is for tracking um, our different features in here. So let's go ahead and uh, we have our features and our labels. Let's go ahead and create the data. This is what we're doing here. Uh, so we have our person and people. Here's our, all our people. It's going to go through each one. We have our path, which is our directory. Always good to double check those. Make sure you go in the right direction. Uh, we can actually print the path out so that as we go, we know we're looking at the full path. Kind of a troubleshooting thing. Um, usually at this point, I've already deleted a lot of these things out of here. And you can see that uh, the guys in the back were, when they were doing it, they forget where they put the files or where they're going. They get some kind of weird error. And then you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, moved, the, I moved the program over one or something like that. And so we need to go ahead and create a label, um, people.index person. So we're creating a, a, a label for our training scenario. And then for each image in the OS list directory per person, we're going to look at each one of those images. Uh, then we'll take that and we'll create the um, uh, image path, image um, array. And here's our reader where we're going to read in the image. Um, here we are in OpenCV. We go ahead and put that into a grayscale. Uh, faces rectangle. So we look at the, find the faces on there and create a rectangle around it. That's what this part is. This is all from what we did before. You already saw this programming in here. Uh, and so we are basically taking our features and filling it up with um, the different faces, just the face. We don't want to look at the whole body shot. Uh, if you remember from the image, one of them had them leaning against a tree. Some of them are close up, some of them are far away. So we really want to look just at the face. And then we're going to go ahead and append our label. So we have our um, features. These are each one of our images. And the label then corresponds to each one of our um, actors. So once we've done that, we have our setup on here. And this is... Um, uh, for training purposes. So that's what we really want to do is we want to create our trainer. Let me come back down here. Uh, create our trainer. <laughs> we want to create, we want to train our model. Uh, so here we come in down here. We have our features. Um, we're going to print that the training is done. So it's gone through and it's, it's cleaned up all the features, all the setup in here. And then we have our face recognizer. This is 
the heart of what's going on. The face recognizer uh, is an LBH face recognizer create. So we're creating a neural network right here. That's the model. And then we take our face recognizer and we train it with our features and our labels. So now we have those different images and we're going to train them on this model here. Um, and then we'll go ahead and just save it. Uh, save features.mpa features and save labels. We're just saving everything. That's all this is down here. And th this is interesting because there's a, so many things we can do down here. Let me just go ahead and run this. Uh, and you can see it's going through and it's opening up each of the files. Uh, and then it goes through and the training's really quick. There's not a lot of data in here. Uh, you know, there's what, a dozen pictures of each one. This isn't like going through uh, seven gigabytes of information that takes a day to process in one of these neural networks and trains them, or two or three days in the case of a project I'm working on. Uh, this is just a small amount of data. So it processes rather quickly. Some of the things you can do on here is um, to incre increase the data just with these images is you can uh, tilt them. You can take them and tilt it by 15% or 10%. Remember earlier we were looking at all those different commands. That is one of the tricks they use for training um, a setup and not knowing what angle the person's going to be at. They might only have 12 pictures and then if you tilt it 15 degrees and 30 degrees in each direction, you've now increased it by five by a factor of five. So now you have about 60 pictures that you're um, doing for each person. So there's a lot of cool things you can do as far as, as your uh, training setup. We've now created our uh, face recognizer. It's trained, it's ready to go. So the next step is to go ahead and use it and let's see what that looks like. So let's go ahead and create our face recognizer recognition setup. Um, and we're going to reload this. Here's our people again, same as before. Of course, you can just leave it up there since uh, with Jupyter Notebook, it automatically brings a lot of this stuff in. And then we have our features, um, about pickles, true. So we're loading up our features. Here's our labels. We're going to load our labels. Remember, we saved them up here. And then we go ahead and take our face recognizer and uh, we go ahead and create that. And then we're going to just read the face trained at the, y, the, the YML file we created. So we're just loading back up what we had up here. That's all that is. This is really good to know about because this makes it very portable. Uh, this way, if you're using it in one location, obviously you can download it, uh, you know, all your security cameras, track your neighbors as they uh, walk down the sidewalk next to your house. And then we're going to just read a image in. And this one we're just going to take right from the um, Ben Affleck, and we're going to do the first, um, the Ben Affleck number one image in there. That's all that is. And we'll go ahead and create our grayscale image. And we'll show that just because it's good to see whatever we're working with. Um, so this is taking our image and converting it to a grayscale. Uh, show person in grayscale. Detect the face in the image. This is nothing new. This is from before. We're doing the uh, Mahar Cascade Detect Multi-Scale setup on there. And then we want to go ahead and create that rectangle around it. Uh, once we create that rectangle around it, then we want to go ahead and do a prediction on it. And let's go ahead and do that. There we go. Um, so here's our, our faces rectangle. And so we're going to create that with our faces ROI. And then here's the key right here. Uh, here's our faces recognizer predict. It's going to return the label and the confidence on here. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and print that label with the confidence of, and it'll show the confidence. And then uh, we'll go ahead and put some text on there and print it out. It's always nice to see what's going on and then another rectangle on there. So we just are, are, we're just showing the image again. So as it comes down, this is the key though, is we want to print out and find out what's the chances of this label being correct. Now, right about now, you should be guessing that it's going to get it correct and you're going to guess it's going to have a very high confidence rating. And the reason you want to guess that is because we didn't take this image out and switch it around. 
Uh, in other words, this image was part of the training, and so it should have a very high confidence and have it correct it's already in the model. And let's go ahead and see what happens. We'll go ahead and run this. And you can see the label says, hey, it's been Affleck with a 99.53%. And if we bring up the images here, whoops, we go ahead and half screen this again so we can see what we got going here. And for whatever reason, it doesn't want to put them on top. Hold on. <laughs> I lost my images. Huh, there it is. And you can see uh, it appeared up on my far left monitor, which I, I don't know why I went there. That was kind of weird. And then there's the grayscale behind it. And you can see here we were able to identify Ben uh, Affleck with a confidence of 99.53. Thank you for joining us today with Simply Learn. For more information, please visit www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.